Hello everybody, Dr. Zero Show. Right now we'll go to Colombia. I have a professor of marketing, Lina Maria Zabellos. Welcome, Ma Lina. How are you? Hi, Sarah. Uh, I'm very good. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be in your show. Thank you very much for accepting and joining from Colombia. You are a professor of marketing, but most of your publications are around fashion. So I want to ask you and Forgive me if I ask very stupid questions, but I want to learn no. <laughs> what is fashion and who cares? Why should we care from the research perspective about the fashion? Well, um, my PhD from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, it's a PhD on consumer apparel and retail studies. So my specialty is fashion marketing in general. And why fashion? Um, in my case, it's because I have a passion for fashion. I just love fashion. It's something that I really care about and doing research is not easy. So um, I focus most of my research on fashion. But why is it important? What is, what is fashion? Mm, fashion has a lot of definitions, but a kind of simple one that maybe a lot of people could relate to. It's a social phenomenon in the way that it, 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 it fashion happens because we're together in a community, in a society, in a world where we relate to each other. And it's a sort of form of imitation. So it's a phenomenon of what is the mode, what is popular. And it does not apply only to apparel, even though it's the category that stands most in the fashion business, but it, it it influences a lot of categories. So you can talk about fashion in cars, you can talk about fashion in certain uh, trends, even consumer trends. You, 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 you could talk about fashion in a lot of uh, different industries, like uh, food industry, like um, what uh, restaurants are serving for food. So fashion, uh, it's an influence of change. Yes. So Is we imitate each other and then yes. we want to we wanna be different. So then we change and then fashion changes. But fashion really studies what's most popular. So but sometimes kind of it might have like no negative connotation as if, you know, it is fashion to sell you more products uh, regularly, etc. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Oh, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a natural phenomenon for current society. Like before, like 300 years ago, fashion was very stable. So indigenous will dress in a certain mode, a certain fashion, but that would stay like that for hundred years or so, right? And so it's the current society that wants change, that likes things to be different. So that involves a change in society because then you wanna look innovative, you wanna look different. So then um, now it's going at a faster pace, which is in one side, very exciting, but on the other side, very challenging for business. And also from the marketing perspectives, it's like companies want to sell you more and you just buy more because of the sake of it. So yeah, there's a dark side of fashion, definitely. definitely. I have a question to you because you, you talk about this visual characteristics of a product yeah. can you please yeah. 
yeah. describing what do you mean and why it is important and it is like yes. relation to aesthetics yes well in marketing the marketing is very broad and focuses in a lot of aspects related to business but we all know that products and services uh, relate to physical products itself obviously there are certain services that do not have physical products but some sort of it and within the product world the physical qualities what we perceive visually about the product it's incredibly important because mm -hmm. we make a lot of decisions not only to see the product to look for information about the product but, but also to decide if to buy it or not to wear it or not to give it as a gift or not and when to discard it all everything Obviously, there's lots of influences, but a very big influence in, in our behavior is the visual aspect of the product. If uh, Take a look uh, on the online world. When, when you purchase something online, especially you cannot online, it. Yes. You, cannot touch it. yes. you cannot wear it. You basically buy, because of the description of the product, the price, which is another attribute of the product, the brand, possibly. Sometimes Maybe the box. The, you like the box. Yeah. Yeah, there's different aspects. But the king of all attributes is how the product looks. Mm -hmm. If it looks innovative, if it looks familiar, the color, the shape, if it's simple, if it's complex, if it's shiny, if it has texture. So mm -hmm. the, all these different aspects of the visual characteristics of the product are something that I'm very passionate about it and, and, and I find very interesting to do research on. Yeah. So, so, so then the follow up question is what is aesthetics in relation to that one? I guess, are they related? Yes. Um, when I study the visual aspect of products, it's, it's kind of like taking a little piece of aesthetics. When, when we talk about aesthetics, aesthetics is, is about perceiving the world through all the senses. So it's not only the visual aspect, it's also the sound, the touch, the feeling. Uh, when I touch a product, that texture, all, all those aspects about how we experience the world, about uh, stimuli, it's aesthetics. But I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm usually focused more on the visual aesthetics of product. Okay, like, like so I, just a question, like for example, when you go to a shop, sometimes there are different smells. Is it part of the aesthetics yep. also? Yes, we have five senses. So everything that comes within the senses, it could be a smell, it could be a sound. So for example, fabric, some people, when they go shopping, they touch a fabric and if it sounds like it makes this sound, they will not purchase it because they, they feel that will be uncomfortable if they wear it and it sounds sounding like. Mm -hmm. So all those aspects are what aesthetics is interested in. So when it comes to fashion, why do you think it is important? That's a very good question. <laughs> well, um, to understand aesthetics, it's incredibly important for marketing, for brands, for products. Why? Because consumer purchase products based on how they look, how they taste, how they are felt all those um experiences and reactions we we get when we interact with the product is what drives purchases besides other aspects of course but understanding how aesthetics affect us and um for example uh, something specific i'm interested in meaning so um for example based on the visual aspects of a product what type of meanings could i create that I'm interested in. And if, if there's a lot of meaning, how attached I could become to a product. And when we talk about attachment, obviously it's a very simple world. Everybody talks about a attachment, but in general, it's like a, a, a very strong emotional bond that a consumer has towards a product. And oh, why is it have an attachment? Like, yeah. But it is also interesting that I have an emotional bond to a physical product. Yes, so, so, it sounds so, weird. 
Yes. That is so true. For like example, as if we are kids, you know, like a kid has an emotional bond to a toy. Do we have this yes. like emotional yes. really oh, come on. If the kid loses the, the the toy, they're like crazy looking for the toy because the, the, the little kid is screaming and says, I'm not gonna leave the apartment if my mom doesn't find my toy. And and that's a, that's a perfect example for attachment towards a product or a more simple, uh, for example, my students there, I'm pretty sure they're very similar to the students all over the world, 20 year olds. If they lose their phones, yeah. it's like whole world collapses because they're incredibly attached to their phones and it's I, a product. Yes, it's a I think. Product. And also two, <laughs> two things like, uh, once I saw that, you know, that there's, there was a fake sketch of iPhone. They just said, they sent a couple of thousand to Stockholm and there was a long queue of people who are willing to buy iPhone. And then actually what will change if you buy two weeks later, three weeks later, you are not going to die, but people were waiting long queues to, to be the first people to buy it. So that was interesting. And when I was doing my master in one of the conferences, one guest said that I'm going to ask you a question. Well, if, if you have two options, you will not have your, this finger, little finger or no phone forever. Which, which one would you pick? Okay. So in, like 30% was okay. Not to have this finger. Yes. <laughs> and then, oh my God, and then the same guy did a couple of years later, it became more than half of the class because they didn't want to be without their phones, but they were okay because the guy said no pain, etc. So it was really yeah. interesting. What type of attachment yeah. do we have to just materialist products? Wow. Yes, and what you described is called is called in marketing. Well, by Al Kasemlin, the author of this topic, it, he calls it self extensions. Because when we get attached to products, we assign a lot of meaning to the product, and then we become very strong emotionally bond to the product. The product becomes a part of ourselves. It's like it's a, it's really literally attached. Like it's a, it's like a finger. So if we lose the product or or, or the product is being damaged or, or the, it gets stolen or something, we literally feel as our cut, our, our, our finger just got, got cut off. So it's that strong how we become attached to products. And then you would say, so why is it important for brands to know this, to understand this phenomenon? Because of course, if you understand the emotional aspects of it, you can do with your design team, kind of like even from marketing perspective, you can work together with product design so you can design products that emotionally connect to consumers. And those so, were the examples that I, I, I sent you about yes. sneakerhead. Shall I show right now? Yeah, uh, I'll show one of them. So, Serdar, um, do you have students that are into the sneakerhead culture? culture? <laughs> no. No? But, but maybe they, they are, but, but I, I didn't know that. You haven't noticed. Okay, yes. so in Colombia, but it, this is very recent. Of course, we were a developing country, but we do have a lot of influence from United States, especially because, well, we're, we're in pet culture has become very, very strong in the last few years. And even though we, we are a very low income country. So for us, 300, $400, it's a lot of money. I mean, you could buy dozens and dozens of shoes for that price. Well, not mm -hmm. dozens, maybe eight pairs of shoes compared to one. And this is, for example, J Balvin, a very, uh, worldwide phenomenon. Uh, he's a singer, Colombian singer. He did a collaboration with Nike. This is the wow. sneakers and people got crazy in Colombia for buying. Very expensive. Sneakers. Is it very expensive? Very expensive. Even it's for Sweden, it is expensive, but for Colombia. It is expensive. Yes. And if you see the aesthetics are very, um, be visually connected with J Balvin's personality about colors. A lot of his songs are about colors, a uh, white, black, yellow. 
his collab collaboration with Bob, SpongeBob, and all these fun things he has done. So if you see like on the street, somebody that knows a little bit about J Balvin or knows a little bit about sneakers, even from the distance, you can recognize those sneakers and say, wow. oh, those are J Balvin's sneakers. So it's very uh, attractive, very shiny in a way. Uh, and that's what people want to look for in a collectionable shoe like this. And it's funny because this is the official price, but when you look for resellers, the price the prices go up. Wow! And in the so, other, so, in the so other is it slide like, that I showed you, but is it like a collect? Like I just want to, I will show the other yeah. one, but I want to understand it because really my my yes. brain, I understand so you pay extremely <laughs> price for some stuff, but a sneaker that will get dirty, you know that you have to change every other year maximum because sometimes a couple of months later mm -hmm. you pay that premium price. Is it like this? That there's oh, yeah. a popular celebrity. When I buy something that he designed, I have an emotional bond to that person, like as if I am touching him. Is it like this? I just want to understand. Uh, I've never thought about it, but I think it's a, it's a good way to put it. In a way, of course, uh, whoever buys these sneakers or have bought them, it's because admires J Balvin somehow or just, or just likes the aesthetics, but probably needs to like J Balvin, right? Yes. Admires him, he makes it so fun. And as you say it, it's like having a little piece of him because those would be shoes that he would wear that he actually okay. designed in a collaboration with Nike. So it's like, it's his style. So it's like having a little piece of him. Yes, you described it correctly. Yeah. How about these? These ex the most expensive sneakers for me. It's like this the sneaker yeah. prices. You can tell the prices if you want. <laughs> it, it's hilarious. The cheapest ones are about six thousand dollars. Go up to twenty thousand, and we really so could go up, could go up to one or two million dollars for a piece of sneakers. So. What? Uh, One and two is, million dollars? Yeah. So this is the power of meaning. This is the power of emotional um, experience with the, but, of the emotional experience with the, with a the product. This is the uh, power. Of but, but does people in Colombia pay it or is it globally? And also, even if somebody pays, I mean, you should have for me, you should have like billion dollar dollars. <laughs> to pay this amount of money for a sneaker, like you could buy a condo. Yes, but not necessarily. Really? Because, no, these, uh, for the fashion industry, we call these aspirational purchases. So sometimes people will not have a good salary or will not have a lot of money. They may not be even be able to have a decent closet, but they do have this huge investment in this single pair of sneakers but, but the funny it... thing is about sneaker, uh, about sneaker heads is that they're actually collectibles okay some students did a research and some people in the sneakerhead world they they could have easily 60 pairs of sneakers 60 pairs just for them and they're usually guys <laughs> so, so it is also Which it is a question you you associated with females isn't yes, it? that's why I'm giving you this example because it's like everybody thinks that it's for girls. Fashion, no, 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 no. It's so powerful that a lot of guys, it's like talking about makeup in South Korea. Oh my okay. God, I think South Korea in makeup purchases more makeup than the whole Colombia for women. Wow, wow. Like, But, but also, the, yes. so, so it yes. is like, like again are, you are talking about like the relation between aesthetic, aesthetics of and the meaning and then i don't know like design so it is and also yes. the investment like, like it is like collectible imagine you buy shoes you never yes. wear well you may wear them for special occasions but when when my students did, did the research on uh, on this uh, subculture of sneakerheads it was interesting because they would actually purchase these very expensive products to clean their shoes to put the shoes they would have special closets it's like 
when a woman likes to have these luxury bags, for example, I have a friend that loves luxury brands, very expensive ones. So he, she has a very normal closet, but she made a special closet just for the bags. So they would not be ruined. They could be in the original boxes, all separate, not piled together. So it's the same for whatever is important to you. When you assign a lot of meaning and a lot of importance to a product, you will take care of it. You will mend it when it breaks. You would resell it. You will treat it as a treasure. Some people even treat it as art pieces. Mm -hmm. in, in some of my research, they would take their uh, dresses or whatever it's meaningful to them, take the piece of, of clothing or shoes, they will put it somewhere and they would sit just by themselves just to admire the product for an hour in this aesthetic experience of the life. So is it like this? You put product in front of you and then you watch it. And they would be just admiring. Wow. <laughs> but, but, but like for business, like somehow I can guess it, but I want to hear from you. You can explain yes. much better because yes. you are the professor in this domain so why it is important for businesses to find is it like this to create better relation or is it like to charge premium because obviously you charge more isn't it a lot of reasons uh, it could be to better design the product uh, to incorporate design features that better connect with the consumer to understand how to better communicate the product so the consumer uh, really understands how the product can solve their problems, how the product can connect with them. It could be also to create loyalty towards the brand, towards the product. It could be so the consumer could use more often the product. Because sometimes we buy things, but we don't we use them so that you, there's, not, there's not a repurchase. But if you find the consumer not not only to purchase it, but also to use it when it's broken, when it's damaged, they may actually repurchase or go back to the brand. And the last thing, which is what I like the most about, and it's that it has sustainability reasons. Like if how we, come? Because for me, fashion is against sustainability. You, know, you want to consume yes, more, depends. sell more, but I want to hear completely agree but the fact that if you care about a product what i said before you're gonna mend it you're gonna clean it you're gonna keep it safe you're gonna use it and take care of it so the product would last longer if the product lasts longer i would not feel the need to go buy a replacement to go buy another product because then it, the, the life cycle of the product gets extended. And, and also, that's good for sustainability reasons. So yes. less products are going to the dumps, to, to, the, to garbage. So it, it is like this, if also I know that it is cool and fashionable to use used product like this, that, that it is, I don't lose any attractiveness if the product is used, then I can say, okay, my product is not new as the new one from the box, but still perceived cool, then it becomes... But, but also I think that you also said something because interesting, if I have a product, imagine normally I buy a shoe, I rarely paint it from time to time, but if it is expensive, you said that people are buying expensive stuff to take care of the product, then it is it opens a new line of products to support this expensive product. So it is also interesting. So, so it is not like you don't sell one time, you are just selling sort of like interesting. You know, I have another thing because since you mentioned that the, the Nike, Nike had another project, I guess somehow it just came to my mind that like create a subscription. So, so do you recall this or, or do you have anything to say about that? Like you have a subscription uh, that, that you can use shoes, like you use it and then send it back. They send you new pairs, etc. So are there different business models in fashion that they are exploring? I'm not familiar with that service. Uh, sounds very interesting. But what I, what I can recall from your last comment is that, yes, people like to buy new. 
However, especially the younger generations are more attentive to sustainability issues or environmental issues. So they're more open to use used product. So for example, in the sneakerhead world, when I'm talking about resale of sneakers, they're, the, they're usually used the sneakers. Really? <laughs> they're not new. I mean, some of them are new and obviously they would have a, a more expensive price on the market. But most of them are actually used the sneakers. But, but is it like by, by celebrity? Maybe it is Michael Jordan wear it. So of course I want to be in the same shoe or it is, is it like uh, no, ordinary no. people? It's a, it's ex-consumer just have really cool <laughs> sneakers, has used them for a while, got tired because he has other 50 pairs. So he decides to put it on Instagram and resell it. And maybe in one day he could get double the price of what he purchased. And after using the product, he could get a profit out of it. But <laughs> it is really, wow. Like imagine you, you make money from the thing that you use. I, th I think we should yes. have this in the car industry because you buy the car, you cannot sell expensive. <laughs> you always lose the value. And then sneakers, sneaker yes. community found that solution. Yes. And that's something else about, for example, now with the circular economy and, and, and all this climate change, uh, the, the, the interest for secondhand clothing has become very popular, especially in the younger generations. And a lot of it, what drives those purchases be, besides environmental interests and, uh, and all that, it's also meaning. Because it's like, okay, I'm, I'm wearing something from the 70s, but it's actually from the 70s. <laughs> it's not recycled. It's not that the designer gets inspired on, on 70s fashion and that this proposal. No, it's actually a piece of the 70s. So, it is so actually... it, all those things have a lot of history, a lot of meaning, and if the right consumer that appreciates that can yes. find those pieces, and the shop can actually tell them a little bit of the story behind those pieces, it would actually be more meaningful. The consumer could connect better and actually pay a good more. price for something no. completely used, completely old, that in general terms could belong to the trash. Well, but it is it is sort of like, you know, like adding the art taste to the commodity products like sneakers. Now you start to perceive it as an art. Isn't it this that you want to, you are okay to pay a bit extra? Am I wrong? Uh, yeah, sort of, but yes, that there's a lot of, there's a strong association of art with fashion, especially when you're talking about top designers. So of course, if you're looking for a secondhand clothes, a um, secondhand store, and you find a uh, vintage Chanel or a vintage, um, Pierre Cardin or, or all these designers, those could actually be kind of categorized more into the art uh, perspective. But uh, of course, it, it depends on how the consumer values those products. I, I have another thing because what would you recommend for the current businesses uh, to explore, to invest in based on your experience in marketing and fashion is one the second one is uh, i would like to hear about your research projects topics what do you do at the university so we know more about your academic world and academic environment maybe some words about the, the university if it is okay for you so we start with the first question um i think there is no general answer um I would say that it depends on the category and the type of product. Maybe let's say a new startup wants to enter, but, wants to create a product. What would you recommend to them from the fashion and marketing perspective? Well, you need to know your consumer. And if you could do at least a little bit of qualitative research, so it's not only the numbers, but also to understand a little bit of what drives those consumers, 
what they're looking for, what's important to them, what, what are their worries, uh, that could actually help you a little bit to, to adjust your product portfolio to the service logic behind, behind what you're offering. So it's, it's a must, even at startup, even if it's um, a small research, obviously you can find a lot of secondary data of mm -hmm. research that other people have done, but you, you need to know your consumer. You need to know your consumer, definitely. So understand your consumer like somehow can you yeah. also because you say qualitative not quantitative i think you you there are some more things that you can talk, tell me about that am i wrong yeah 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 uh, especially of course you're a professor but in, in the general terms some people get uh, confused those terms so what, when i say about quantitative research is surveys like amount of people so how many people are in this geographical area between 20 and 28 mm -hmm. from these uh, income levels, whatever? But it's more to understand who are these people? So you need to, what well, you need to do uh, interviews, you need to do focus groups, you need to do uh, some observation, maybe do a benchmark of similar brands and maybe go, go to the stores, look, who comes in, what are they dressing, who they may be, what, what are they purchasing? So it's more about the understanding behind the numbers. So numbers are needed. I completely agree with that. But you need to understand uh, a little depth behind those numbers. Those numbers could be empty and you can Is make it like this meaning behind the numbers. No, no, meaning behind yes. the numbers. Yes, you need to under, really understand the numbers. And yes. I say it because, for example, last week, I had a very successful entrepreneur visit my class. And he was uh, talking, uh, talking with my students about why do my market research. That's one of the classes to, to, to connect it with the second question of yours about what I do in my, in my school. And I remember him, he has like, he has created more than uh, a dozen of startups. Mm -hmm. He calls himself a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> yes. And, and, and he actually told the students, every time I'm going to launch a new brand, I do market research. I, hi I hire or at least I do it. And he has a little simple rule, which I like. He says, at least ask 25 people, at least. Mm -hmm. What do you think about these? Do you like this logo? Would you buy this product? So, it, 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 and, and talk to them. Ask ask some questions, because it, with with quanti with this type of research, he he told us that he actually realized that in some of his first startups, he was focusing towards a, a consumer that was not going to purchase his product. Ah. So it is so a during the the little asking about people, he decided, oh my God, I was focused here and no, no, these other people are the ones that are going to purchase my product. So, so even if it's not in a big scale, but you need to do some, some kind of testing the waters before you go big. And especially if you invest a lot of money. I lost. I'm not listening. Sorry, okay, got it. like there was a, but. I pressed the wrong button. Now, if you talk about your yeah. research, what do you do at the university? Which university? What do you do at the university? That will be great. Okay. Um, I work at Universidad Eafit. It's like a, the main business school here in Medellin. Medellin is the second largest city in Colombia, in South America. And uh, this is my hometown. So in, in, I actually did my undergrad there. To be so able to I work have, at the hometown. Yes, uh, I, I love the school where I'm at. It's a teaching and reading school. So um, so we, we have both responsibilities. We do a lot of teaching and we are also encouraged to do research. Most of my research, as I mentioned before, is uh, uh, focused on fashion marketing. Uh, quite a lot of different aspects, uh, more so towards the consumer aspect of it, but I've done a little bit of branding out of retail. 
Uh, but most of it, it's towards the consumer aspect. Um, so what I mentioned about the importance of visual aesthetics, how the products looks. For example, some of my research is about a uh, design it's called the Maya principle. Maya, it's most advanced yet acceptable products. So this principle says like that in most, general, not just to most, repeat, most advanced, advanced yet, yet acceptable. acceptable. Can you give products. me some examples, like for illiterate people yes. like me? Yes, no, no, you need an explanation. So it, what the design principle says is that the most commercially viable products are those that share a balance between two visual aesthetic properties, novelty and typicality. Translated into simple world, words yes. is that the product needs to be novel, perceived as new, different, but not too much because it, it will feel risky, like, well, unrecognizable, right? So like a good balance of novelty. And as well, it needs to be typical. Typical meaning it needs to be similar to the most typical product in the category. So if it's a TV, it needs to be similar to a TV. It doesn't need to look like a lamp and any result that it's a TV, right? Is it like so to be familiar? Familiar to be to familiar. Me. Yes, okay. but not too familiar because if it's too familiar, it would be boring. Yes. So a product needs to be perceived new, but not too new, and familiar, but not too familiar. So if you have a good balance between the two, you've actually created the most commercially viable product. Hmm. Are there some examples that you can give? So, I just want to... So for example, in the fashion world, when you go to a hacketeur fashion design, the one that you see on London Fashion Week, Paris yes. Fashion Week, that you're like, oh, that's a scary, all these dresses, like, oh, giant. Yes. Who, and, who, who and, and you're like, who wears that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's not supposed to be worn. <laughs> so why? Unless it's Lady this? Gaga or something, right? No, no. Yes. So, Lady Gaga, we know from many yes. yes. She gets yes. So, so yes, that's, that's the, the, the designer, which is a brand, stating, I'm very innovative, I'm very noble, I'm on the top of the edge of the world, I can change the fashion industry, right? But what do they sell? They do not sell those designs. They sell the Pret-a-Porter and all the diffusion lines that actually sell similar things based on the modern designs, but they make it more commercially viable. So what do they do? They apply the Maya principle. So they mm. tone down the novelty, they make it more familiar, they make it simpler. It, it, it could actually be worn on the street. Okay, because so for me, when, when there is a car exhibition, usually the cars that are, I know they showed some premium cars, but usually the cars that will be in the market one year later, they are, yes. they put the car that people can buy. But sometimes they put some, some futuristic design you dream to yeah. buy it, but it is not available. So this is the big, this is uh -huh. the, this is yes. the, because it's of the same that. principle. Yes. Okay. Exactly they shock the you. Same. Is it like they shock you? Yes. Yes. And then they show you something that you will not be shocked to buy. Yes. No, but the shocking part is important because it makes a statement. Yes. It draws your attention. You know, attention is very expensive and very hard to find. So they draw your attention. You're looking at the brand, you're looking at the product, but then you're like, oh, amazing, but I'm not gonna buy that. Oh, that's too expensive. Oh, let me show you an alternative. Mm -hmm. Soon, the Maya, which actually has the Maya principle, which is soon, and that's the one you're gonna buy. Can we say so, a Tesla is doing the same thing? When they introduced their yeah. car, I don't know if you recall, they had this strange car and then they said, just try to break it. Actually, they broke it, <laughs> but yeah. they just, they're so, like, they're... so it, yes, so it's, it's like, that's how they attract your attention. That's kind of like, oh. and then when you're hooked, they present you the one that you can actually purchase that you will actually buy. It's actually, in the fashion world. It's like when you, when you go to a shopping mall and you see Sarah, 
you see this shocking design on the window display and you're attracted you get the attention beautiful all this shiny mm -hmm. like a bear tiger you may not actually wear that but it drove you to go inside the store and when you are inside yeah. the store what do you buy you buy Something the simple else. design the basic shirt a very typical one and then you buy a little bit more modern design that actually it's balanced between novelty and typicality perfectly the maya principle in, well, in but... fashion world it's called the best sellers or the uh, fashion items those fashion items the best sellers of all the stores are usually those that apply the maya principle okay interesting because now again i i want to recall to say like kids like like kids they got our attention we go in then we realize we are adults we shouldn't buy this stuff we should buy something else interesting because when i got my first car i got it mazda but, but i really wanted to buy this mazda racing cars in miata it wasn't just that much expensive i could afford it but in then it's okay it is too low it is only for two people i will do i bought mazda but i didn't buy that brand but it was the thing that got my attention was the race car so so like racing yes. style car okay so it seems i was yes. hooked so i was tricked and if you if you think about it that goes back to a term that i said earlier so the miata was your aspirational purchase it's like oh it's like this desire like your dream but then when you think about the numbers think about the practicality what you're really going to use it for then you finally decide to go for another purchase but the aspirational purchase was the one that approached you to the brand made you ask questions got you motivated it created that drive to go closer to the brand yes de yes def definitely definitely so it is really interesting but, but when it comes to researchers right right now you are professor what will you recommend new generation to pursue their research topics do you have any streamline that you recommend before we finish for today well, I got hooked in many use of research. research but uh, but uh, are you talking about advice for young research or yes, like the MPH budget? Um, well, young researchers. I think if you to, you, I think if you're going into a research path, choose something that you're very excited about. For example, I have. For example, my dissertation topic was the Maya principle, and I've done okay. more research on it because I really like the topic. But I've had some classmates from my PhD that they just got sick of the topic. They don't, they don't want to see it ever, ever again. So the idea would be to really pick pick topics that you're very interested about that you you don't get tired to talk about it. Even if you change, it's it's okay to shift and and find your way and find your interests. But every time you find opportunities, it needs to be something that you really care. Research is not easy. <laughs> no. So for you to persevere, you need to find something that you're very connected to. That you find isn't it? Need. Isn't it also hard to pick what you really want in the beginning? So is it okay that we change the topic? Is it better to change yeah. as soon as possible? So what do you recommend? Yeah, yeah. For example, I knew it was fashion, but I changed my dissertation like three times. Okay. A dissertation topic before formally starting doing my dissertation. So it's especially for the dissertation, you need a topic that you really that, that has a lot of potential. Not not only that it has interest, that it has potential. Um, so you, you, yeah, you need to be careful and if you're not sure, take your time. It's better to take longer in the, in the initial phases that get lost in translation later on. Okay. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your sharing your expertise, your knowledge and for your advices, Professor Lina Maria Sabellos. It is great to have you. Thank you very much for joining Dr. Zero Show from Colombia. Oh, I feel honored to be part of your show. So thank you, Sarah, for the invitation. It was lovely to be part of it. Thank you.